Welcome. Welcome to NS Meetup. Everybody, grab a seat. We're going to get started. Have a seat. Welcome. It's a little cold in here. A little chilly. Anyone have a Galaxy Note 7 I could borrow? <laughs> Welcome to uh, NS Meetup. This is our October meetup, a little later than we usually do it. Um, tonight, we have a great speaker for you, but I'd just like to do a few house rules. I'm Steve Dorico. I'm the organizer of NS Meetup. Um, if you guys have any questions or concerns, you can at reply at NS Meetup. Um, I'll be sure to respond. My email address is all over nsmeetup.com. So if you need anything, please let me know. The group is all about helping you guys and um, really uh, pushing open source projects like the one we have tonight. Uh, if you haven't already, grab yourself a drink. We got beer. We got water, that little filtering machines over there. That's great. We got some Coca-Colas, a few other things. Um, recycles right next to it, if you don't mind. If you're looking for the restroom, it's just past the elevators where you guys came in, down the hall a little bit. Uh, if you need to get up during the talk, please feel free. Uh, no, um, no big deal there. And quick show of hands, who is at their first NS meetup? All right. A uh, round of applause for the newbies here. Welcome, NS newbies. So yeah, if, if you guys haven't been here before, it's the first Wednesday of every month. Uh, keep an eye out on nsmeetup.com. Sometimes we push it like the, this week we did. Um, if you have any questions, please come find me. And without anything else to do, I would like to introduce Levi from Pinterest. It's got to see if this, all right, it's, I think it's just straight directional, so I'll have to hold it up. Cool. Hey, I'm Levi McCallum. I, uh, manage the engineering, uh, the iOS core experience team at, at Pinterest. Um, my team works on the core platform and framework to the Pinterest app at iOS. Um, here's a wonderful photo of a few people that make the iOS app come together at Pinterest. Um, but before I get into the technical aspects of tonight's talk, I wanted to provide a little backstory. Um, see, late last year, our team was char charged with a, solving a pretty complex problem. You see, Pinterest has a rapidly growing international user base. In fact, over 50% of people on Pinterest are outside of the US. A significant portion of our iOS uh, user base use iPhones three to four generations old. And with this increasingly global audience, we had to start thinking about building an app that performed well on old devices as we scaled the product. At the same time, our amazing design team was cre creating a design system that would allow teams to move quickly and create new experiences in the product without creating inconsistencies. Our design engineering org <coughs> excuse me, was also growing rapidly, and we needed a solution that would allow developers to iterate quickly while maintaining consistency in the design spec and ultimately uphold app performance. So we needed to resolve some of the existing issues like dropped frames and slow image loading while loading through pins. To achieve the type of performance we needed, it wouldn't be possible using the auto layout base architecture the app was originally built on. We needed to create a framework that was fast to build in and easy to scale. And through the leadership of Scott Goodson, the team quickly identified Async Display Kit as the foundational framework to help us meet these performance goals. It was clear as we built the app with this framework, we needed to invest uh, deeper and kind of take it in as our own and help it uh, grow into a platform that scales. So over the past year, we did just that and introduced a series of improvements that brought us to Async Display Kit 2. And so tonight, I want to share with you just one part of the story of Async Display Kit at Pinterest and how we engineered a layout API that enables us to achieve high performance and great design at scale. There are four main areas I want to cover tonight. First, we're going to take a look at the fundamentals of Async Display Kit. And then I want to give you a little taste of the new layout API and show you how it builds upon these fundamentals. Next, we're going to take a deep dive into the layout engine and see how it works under the hood. And then finally, we're going to take a look at transitions and how to animate layout in this new declarative world. So the fundamentals. There are many facets to Async Display Kit, and I really wouldn't do it justice 
to give an entire overview in this talk. So I'm just gonna focus on some of the core principles to get you up to speed on how it provides great UI performance. So first, let's focus on core animation. 60 times a second, your app has a deadline. It has to handle incoming events like touches and draw its UI on screen through core animation. Here's a picture of these events at 1 60th of a second. If you spend too much time on a frame, you won't be able to achieve 60 frames consistently. Skipping frames will feel choppy, and worse yet, because each frame is processed on the main thread, the more time spent rendering frames, the less time your app has to handle future incoming events, which will make your app feel unresponsive. So let's zoom into a frame here and see what you have control over before core animation renders it on screen. There are two main stages. First is your uh, event handling stage. You're, as a developer, it's your responsibility to handle events as quickly as you, as you can. With strategic considerations like dispatch queues and preloading and caching, you can pretty easily optimize this overhead. The second and probably most important phase is the commit transaction phase. This is the process that UIKit goes through to update your app's UI and commit to the core animation render server to be rendered on the GPU. Here, layout is performed. Backing layers are drawn and images are decoded. And as straightforward as this process is, there are some common performance bottlenecks that plague most apps. First up, the single threaded nature of UIKit means that all of this work, including your event handling, is performed on the main thread. Taking too much time on drawing layers, for example, interrupts user interaction and can make your app feel unresponsive. Secondly, most of the work done in the commit transaction phase is CPU or I.O. bound. And this work is not done concurrently, which means that it can't take advantage of the multiple cores of modern iOS devices. For example, drawing text is an expensive process, and it's dependent on layout before it can even start drawing. So rendering significant amounts of text quickly is often a cumbersome process to optimize. Image decoding is in a similar bucket <clears throat> because even though it's at the end of the, trans, uh, the commit transaction stage, your, your app uh, you know, scrolling through a uh, collection view with, with hundreds of images, uh, there's a huge penalty that you're gonna pay um, and the cost of image decoding can mean a huge difference in frame rate. So now we know some of the performance problems of rendering IO, UI on iOS. Let's take a look at the optimizations Async Display Kit provides during this process. First, we move the CPU and IO bound work off the main thread. We can't help that drawing, layout, drawing and layout are slow processes, but we can make them concurrent and potentially utilize the multiple cores on our devices. Beyond concurrency, let's also make this work asynchronous. By asynchronously calculating layout and drawing the backing image, the user doesn't have to wait for the CPU intensive work to complete. Async Display Kit intelligently dispatches this work ahead of time, so more time is available to handle incoming touches and to commit more frames. Finally, we need an abstraction that hides away the complexity of achieving this level of asynchronous and concurrent UI rendering, and it needs to feel very familiar to UIKit developers. This abstraction is the display node. The display node is a thread safe object that enables concurrent UI operations that normally could not be done on background threads with UIKit. Namely, these are the CPU bound layout and drawing operations that would be normally main thread intensive. In their concurrent state, we can asynchronously ditch batch, dispatch this work to be potentially done in parallel. Here, you can see a green block representing the UI kit layout and drawing work that would normally be done on the main thread and block it to uh, block interrupt, uh, incoming touch events. With the display node, this work is split up into concurrent pieces and asynchronously dispatched to the background threads. This frees up main to handle incoming touch events as the user interacts with the app. A node represents a view or a layer. It's responsible for creating a backing representation when the asynchronous operations are complete. Property values like frame or background color are passed down to the underlying view when it's finally loaded. 
Nodes are designed to feel familiar to views. And in the same way to how a layer backs a view, views back nodes, or a layer can back a node too. And just like you're used to with the view hierarchy, you create a display node hierarchy that describes your UI. The simplicity of UIKit is retained, but now you have the confidence that UI, your UI's layout and display classes are optimized asynchronously. So the best way for me to describe how to make a node is just to walk you through building one. So let's make this pin node here. So here we have a subclass of ASL node, which is a display node type. And it has three subnodes, um, an image node, a title node, um, this from node, two are text nodes, and one is a network image node. Network image node handles um, remote URL fetching of an image, downloading, and decoding. In the initialization, I pass in this model and I apply some of its properties uh, directly to the nodes themselves. Finally, I insert the nodes into the hierarchy just as you would with your view hierarchy. Then, here I'm allocating it. I instantiate the pin node, I set the frame, and then by calling pin.view, that means I'm actually allocating the view and applying this frame value directly onto the view. This way, I'm actually able to insert it directly into the view hierarchy. Okay, so how do we then do layout? So as great as auto layout is, it just unfortunately doesn't work in the background. You know, now that it's main thread intensive, it's essentially blocking main, and it's a huge performance challenge when trying to build UI at scale. Manual layout is a common strategy in high-performing apps, and the first version of async display kit was modeled after a popular layout idiom that, of size that fits and uh, layout subviews. This provides a familiar ma a manual measure layout pattern with an additional element of caching. So let me quick, quickly walk you through how uh, layout was done in Async Display Kit 1 to give you a taste of uh, the advances in Async Dis Display Kit 2. So here I am instantiating the node again. I insert the node into the view hierarchy, but here I'm calling this measure method. The measure method um, is basically like size that fits, but with a, an element of caching. So every subsequent call to measure will um, not go through the process of measuring. So I can take the size value and set it directly on the frame. Here's the actual implementation inside my node. And so you can see here, this is quite the, uh, the eyesore of, of working with manual layout, but the general idea is you, you pass a constrained size, you're then uh, responsible of sizing your children and then providing uh, the exact size of the pin node uh, at the end. And then we have the layout. So this layout method, this is actually triggered by the underlying views layout subview uh, call. So just think of this as layout subviews. Um, and so in this process, uh, with async display kit, you take the cache values, so this calculated size property here, and you apply it to the individual frames of your, your uh, subviews. And by doing this, um, each subsequent call to layout, any time a layout pass happens, it will immediately be using the cached values. So this brings me to node containers. In, in the few examples I've shown you so far, um, I've been doing a lot of like view hierarchy manipulation and the measurement myself. Um, with async display kit, uh, there is a series of intelligent containers uh, that do this work for you. And so nodes are just this thread safe abstraction and you should most likely be delegating a lot of the work to containers because this is really where the magic happens. So first rule of thumb is that you should be rarely calling measure yourself in your view hierarchy. The true asynchronous layout benefits of async display kit are done by node containers. Node containers are very familiar uh, to you if you've, um, <clears throat> as, as a UI kit developer, and they're a very simple entry point to start using Async Display Kit in your apps. Um, this is a common misconception of this idea that uh, ASDK requires uh, kind of a complete holistic implementation. With node containers, you can insert it into various aspects of your app. Um, and so they come in a bunch of different flavors. There's a collection view, there's a table view, there's a view controller, uh, we have a pager node. Um, and their APIs are very similar to what you would expect. 
um, almost all of your node hierarchies will be run by these node containers. And for example, the Pinterest app um, is almost exclusively built using these three uh, node containers. And so the real kind of reason for all of this is the intelligent preloading. Um, this is really kind of the magic behind everything here. Um, intelligent preloading allows ahead of time preloading, um, dispatch onto the background thread, render, rendering to be extremely approachable. Um, and a lot of this work that you would end up having to write yourself and kind of writing these over-optimized abstractions are really kind of pushed down into these node container layers. So let me give you this quick visualization of node containers. Uh, this is the AS collection view container. Um, I'll just run the animation and kind of walk you through it. So it's, it's gonna say visible range here, and this is the, everything that's visible. In the display range, it kicks off rendering of backing images, and then in preload, it kicks off the network requests for the individual images. And so by this visualization, this node container basically <clears throat> has certain ranges where it uh, intelligently tells the cell to st start kick off uh, a certain um, operation. So for, for instance, in the display range, it kicks off asynchronous rendering of the backing image so that by the time it hits the visible range, um, the, the backing cell is ready to be shown. And then in the preload range, it kicks off the network requests so that by the time that it's, it's in the visible range, that everything is ready to go to be shown. And then finally, in this exit range, it's, it's a great utility for, um, for memory management because um, as things are leaving and entering the exit range, uh, the, the backing display and then the, the preloaded items will be uh, discarded and it will just be uh, like a fully laid out item. So now you know some of the fundamental powers of Async Display Kit. Um, and a little bit of kind of the background of the layout API. Um, I wanna walk you through this new layout API and how it builds upon kind of these manual uh, layout implementations. So first let me describe a few implicit desires we had while kind of building this layout API into the framework. First, it really had to be fast. Any layout solution had to uphold these like, core speed requirements of Async Display Kit. It also had to be asynchronous. The true power of a Async Display Kit is its asynchronous optimizations, and processing layout in the background was paramount. Third, it had to be declarative. At Pinterest, we needed a new paradigm to engineer our design spec as composed by UI components. Much manual layout code describes the how of layout, but we really needed a system that just described what. Declarative was vital for the solution. However, we needed a system that would also hold up the imperative strengths of async display kit. Uh, for example, being able to interact with gestures or um, you know, the animation blocks. And then finally, it had to be cacheable. It was critical that anything wor any work done in, this, in these layout paths should be kept around for, for future, um, future uh, layout passes. So our solution was layout specs. Layout specs are immutable specifications for common layout patterns. Um, specs themselves have no visual, visual representation, but they simply are designed to encapsulate the map to position and size elements on screen. Layout specs provide hierarchical API to allow the nesting of simple uh, layout rules to build very complex uh, relationships of views on screen. And because they build upon the constrained size pattern of manual layout, their declarative definition allows them to automatically respond to size changes and adapt to new situations. They also have uh, deep integration with trait collections to support multi-device layouts. There are a bunch of pre-built uh, layout specs that come with ASDK2, um, but instead of walking through all of these, let me just go through and rebuild pin node again with some of these core uh, layout specs. So first up, calculate size that fits in the manual layout world becomes layout spec that fits. This returns a layout spec object that describes the node and its children's size and position. A constrained size is still passed in, but it's no longer just a fixed CG size. It's this, rel uh, 
this uh, AS size range. It's a struct with a minimum and maximum CG size to allow kind of expanding uh, constraints. Okay, so now we have this stack layout object here. This stack layout is very similar to the behavior of CSS Flexbox. We've tried to stay as true to the, the uh, implementation as possible. And I also just want to mention that this stack layout just couldn't have been possible without the tremendous help of the component kit framework. Um, so this stack layout, I'm laying things out in the vertical direction with 20 points of spacing between the items. The stack layout is one of the most useful, uh, most useful and like versatile uh, layout specs in, in async display kit. So next, because the image is loaded remotely, we need to give it a size. Layout specs and display nodes have a style property that provide a context object to help determine the size during the layout process. This implementation works well for you know, 150 by 150, but what we really need to do is have an image that you know, really spans any constraint size that's given. So here we introduce the ratio spec. The ratio spec takes a ratio, which is the width divided by the height, and it sizes the, the child, so here the image node is the child of the ratio, uh, based upon uh, that ratio. So in the case of the pin node, if I change the constraint size, the ratio of the image would continue to be a square. Okay, so we're close to done here, but first we need to add the inset margins uh, of the text that was below the image. So I'm gonna set up this, this inset layout spec, and inset lay, layout spec takes a UI edge inset, and here I'm adding left and right margins of 20 pixels. Um, by, inserting, by inserting this inset into the layout spec, I've now essentially created uh, an item in the stack that now can have insets. And so, all I have to do is take another stack inset and I insert it in the, uh, sorry, a stack layout, and I insert it in the inset spec, and it's unaware of the fact that it needs to be inserted, but the stack spec can lay out the items in a vertical direction. So now you get a little taste of working with the layout spec API. I just wanna give you a deep dive into the layout engine and show you how this works in meeting our original goals. So it all starts with this layout element protocol. The layout elements are what allow us to build these trees of layout specs and display nodes. <clears throat> But there's much more to them than that. Their main job is to compute and return a size of itself. The main method here is layout that fits, which takes a constrained uh, AS size range. Remember, this is the minimum size it could be or the maximum size it could be. Layout that fits computes an AS layout object, which has, represents the size of the layout element. And remember, lay, layout elements are both uh, display nodes and layout specs. A layout object is an immutable representation of the size and position of a layout element. In the context of a display node, we're able to calculate them in the measure pass, cache them, and use them for future layout passes. If you recall back to the async display kit one, uh, code snippets, uh, we're using the calculate, calculated size cached value. Now this turns into calculated layout. And so layout does not just represent size, but it now can also represent position. The real power of layout objects is that they're hier hierarchical. A root layout element can only determine its own size. It can't determine its, its position, but it can determine the positions of its child layouts relative to itself. This allows layout elements to return layout objects that not only describe itself, but provide a complete picture of how each of its children are positioned on screen. So if we just think about display nodes, that means we can recursively walk this layout spec tree that you've returned in layout spec that fits, 
and end up creating a tree that describes the size and position of all the subnodes within the node. Since we cache the layout object at the measure pass, with this extra information about the subnodes, we can automatically set the frames of every subnode in future layout passes. So now you have some context on these basic building blocks. Let me give you a taste of what the measure pass now looks like in ASDK2. It's now a four-step process. First, you return your layout spec tree. So if you recall, we built the, uh, the layout spec tree in, um, in the pin node, and so this represents that diagram. Secondly, layout that fits is recursively called on the tree to produce an AS layout tree. AS layouts, recall, have uh, sub layouts, and so they can be hierarchical. We then flatten the layout. Um, in the flattening process, we basically walk the entire tree and we identify what nodes are subnodes of this node. And so we can actually get an accurate picture of the subnodes' uh, position and size. And then by caching that, we can then in the next future layout passes use these values. So what does the layout pass now look like? Well, it's actually completely automatic. You, as a developer, don't need to do anything. It's the layout spec definition is uh, all the work that you do. Um, here's just kind of a, a little snippet of what the actual base implementation looks like now. Because we now have this calculated layout, we just go into the sub layouts, which is that flattened uh, amount, and we iterate through those, and we just say, hey, for each of those subnodes, apply those frames. And so we now have a uh, like a central source of authority um, for the subnode size and position that was pre-calculated ahead of time. So now that we understand kind of the layout process, I wanted to give you kind of a, a look inside of a layout spec. Um, there's, there's a bunch of layout specs, but I feel like inset would probably be the one that fits best on slides. Um, so here's kind of like a quasi not working implementation, and we'll just fill it out and we'll make this work. So basically, Inset spec is, is a AS layout spec, and it takes some insets. And so this method here, its entire job is to return an AS layout that represents the size of the inset itself, but at the same time, <clears throat> but at the same time, um, layout specs are responsible for laying out their children. You see, because layout specs are hierarchical, <clears throat> they then have to uh, have a contract to call layout that fits on all of their children. By calling layout fits on their child, their child sizes, returns an AS layout, but then the parent is responsible for defining the position. So here, we're, we measure the child, so if you can think back to the original example of the pin node, this would be your stack spec, and then you set the position on, on the stack spec, and then in the sub layouts of an AS layout, that will be your stack spec. So here you also see this inset constrained size. I'll get to that in a second. Um, but basically the idea here is to provide a, a changed uh, world view for the child, uh, like a different constrained size. So we'll just jump in here. There's a lot of kind of layout math. I would say ignore most of this, but the idea is the insets are subtracted from the, the original constrained size passed by the parent. So the idea is, is that the parent is giving a smaller worldview to the child so that the child can size itself within that uh, constrained size. And then finally, we need to give the parent itself that final computed size. And so the idea here is that now that we've measured the child and we know um, its, its size, we can then go ahead and use that in the final values of applying these margins uh, to get the, the actual size of the node. So that's kind of a walkthrough of the, the things that are within Async Display Kit to create, um, you know, to create layout and to, to kind of position your UI. But I think one of the great things about layout specs is just building your own. And at Pinterest, we have a design spec that strives 
consistently across devices. So there's kind of this adaptive nature to uh, screen sizes and uh, to, to units. And so to achieve uh, one aspect of that mission is that we have this 12 column grid um, that lives across all our mobile uh, designs. We also have added uh, like a custom adaptive unit. It's, we call it a buoyant, but this idea of a, uh, a unit of measurement that changes based upon uh, device idiom, uh, screen rotation, uh, device size. And so with this kind of requirement, we're able to completely encapsulate this into a custom layout spec. Um, and what's really amazing about this is that because we were able to build this in a custom encapsulation, it was also like trait collection aware so that as these um, you know, device screen sizes were changing, we essentially didn't need to change the layout code. And I would say the best use case to show this in is, is iPad multitasking. Um, so when we introduced iPad multitasking, we had to do some work to like build up the kind of framework aspect of it, but the true kind of layout aspect with all the layout specs, that didn't need to change. Um, as we were able to kind of transform the views and stuff like that, it, uh, it worked pretty well. So finally, I wanted to share with you an additional icing on top of the cake um, that we were we added when, when building this layout API. Um, after building a significant portion of the app with layout specs, it was clear we needed a solution uh, for animation. Um, so for example, our app's sign-up flow is built entirely using layout specs. And so you notice that kind of transition, that push between uh, different items there. Uh, we kind of had this initial implementation of like just basic uh, you know, view blocks, uh, manipulating the frames directly in this imperative world. Um, and it worked pretty well, but there was just a ton of boilerplate. Uh, we consistently had to uh, kind of call measure, make sure things were invalidated. Um, and then kind of even more cumbersome is just making sure the right nodes were in the hierarchy. You know, were the views on screen? Okay, we'll make sure that uh, the timing there is correct so that um, you know, where we're managing the right views to be shown and the one, right ones to be removed. So we kind of looked at the, the design of the, the layout API we had so far, and it was pretty clear that the layout tree app, uh, like representation that we had cached, uh, we could easily use it uh, for like animation behavior. And so we, we created this API for layout spec transitions. Um, so basically, it enables you to animate between layout spec definitions. Let me walk you through this very simple contrived example. Um, so generally here, we have like a stack layout spec that represents that sign up, um, sign up flow you just saw. And so it has a label field, a, uh, a progress node, a button node, but this, this field child here is, is very important because this field state value is an enum, and based upon the, the state of the enum, we'll you know, provide a different uh, node for you. And so by calling uh, you know, set needs layout, um, it would essentially change uh, what node would be in the stack view. And so with our animation API, we're essentially able to change that field state enum and call transition layout. And async display kit will intelligently identify what needs to change, what frames need to be interpolated, um, and then implicitly animate this for you. So how does this work? Um, so when calling the transition layout method just then, async display kit generates a, a new layout tree to represent uh, the kind of the future state of the layout. And then it compares that tree with the previous one and figures out those interpolated frame values. Um, and so there's a default implementation. So when, when new ones, new nodes are inserted, it will fade them in. When old ones are removed, it'll fade them out. 
Um, also, as, as brains change, it'll just uh, inter interpolate those. Um, but then there's a API where you can implement your own custom uh, animation blocks. So for example, this sign up flow is a, is a custom animation block where, you, uh, where basically in the display node, you can kind of work with something that's very similar to uh, the UI kit, uh, sorry, the UI view, uh, view controller uh, animation API. We use this uh, transition API. It's, it's currently opt-in. Um, so you call this, this flag automatically manages subnodes within your display node. And so what is this automatically manages subnodes? Um, so recall the fact of, you know, we have a new tree, we have an old one, we can now kind of compare them. Well, now we can compare them with a diffing algorithm and essentially identify what nodes do we need in the new layout spec and which ones do we don't need. And so by doing that, we can actually have a, a complete list of what needs to be inserted and what needs to be removed and do that for you behind the scenes. And you know, as we we're building this thing, we realized that, hey, this is not just for animation. We could just apply this everywhere. Um, and so you know, we're at this point now where we can basically kind of set state in nodes and trigger a relay out. And by setting that state, there will be enough information there uh, to kind of define a new layout spec hierarchy that will uh, redefine what nodes need to be in the, the node hierarchy. And I, I think this is like putting us in a pretty interesting direction where the layout spec is now kind of this central authority. It's not like a you know, totalitarian authority of, of what needs to be you know, on, in the node hierarchy but this idea that it could be kind of this central place where uh, most of your UI is defined and it describes what, what is actually on screen. Um, but it, it provides a nice balance between this imperative world where you know, maybe you still need to insert a subnode or, or remove one manually. So in closing, uh, we spent the last year kind of identifying very consistent patterns in our Pinterest product code and then kind of codifying them and bringing them back into Async Display Kit. And so I wanted to share with you some reflections that come to mind. So first of all, design at scale. Like, layout specs have really enabled us to achieve adaptive uh, design at this kind of framework level so that uh, this ambitious design framework that um, our design team laid out, we could really achieve that, not just at this like UI component level, but at this kind of more invisible constraint grid and, and um, you know, layout position level. Um, so what this has enabled us to do is kind of uh, you know, really empowered us to create these components that are not only reusable but are surprisingly robust in kind of new situations that you know, we, we haven't, uh, we essentially haven't um, you know, planned for. I would say like multitasking is definitely along the lines of that. Um, you know, building, what's interesting about this layout API is that it's, it's enabled us to not only like maintain the speed, but also kind of apply this layer of simplicity uh, that you know, manual layout really didn't provide before. Uh, it was definitely very scary in previous projects of using Async Display Kit. Of, of, of telling developers that they weren't allowed to use auto layout anymore. And so uh, I, I'm pretty like, happy of the direction we're going with this, you know, applying uh, this layer of simplicity to the framework. <clears throat> uh, what I would also say is, is pretty interesting. It's, it's a built a bridge for us between these imperative and declarative worlds. You know, we're not it's strictly declarative now that you have to build these like escape hatches to like essentially enable you to do imperative uh, work. Um, the strength of Async Display Kit is that it's, it's uh, you know, proudly imperative in that it allows you to kind of interface with things like gestures and you know, really kind of complex imperative animations. And so as we've added this declarative layout layer, um, it's, it works surprisingly well and kind of adds a nice balance to it. And then I'd say finally, our work on ASDK over the past year has really, really changed the way that we build apps at Pinterest. Um, you know, we've 
and like double down our, on our investment in the framework, and we're really seeing it transform into a new, uh, you know, a new thing beyond just being a great performance platform, but really becoming like a new paradigm for building iOS apps. Um, so uh, ASDK two, I recommend uh, going trying the beta. Uh, just go to ASDK.org. Uh, sorry, async display kit.org, and um, yeah, uh, it's on GitHub. I just really want to say thanks to the whole ASDK team for working so hard on it the last year. Um, finally there. <laughs> um, and then, uh, yeah, I'd highly recommend you join us on Slack. We have a thriving developer community on Slack. Um, so if you ever just want to like get started with the framework, you want to start contributing, or you really want to like get into the community, um, yeah, go to ASDK.org. Slash Slack. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Questions? Uh, you're saying the, the caching layer of the images? Hmm, interesting. So um, what's been really great with our work with Async Display Kit is um, the partnership of these other frameworks we have, like a pin remote image and pin cache. We, we built a Pinterest, and we've actually integrated them pretty deeply within ASDK. And so it allows us to essentially tune and optimize um, you know, very explicitly, uh, A, how do we handle like decoding? How do we handle like uh, you know, progressive JPEG downloading, but it also uh, allows us to be very specific about how we're handling um, uh, image caching. Um, so what's pretty interesting about like, um, you know, AS Network Image Node and, and AS Image Node is that, you know, they work directly with these frameworks. Um, but as these kind of intelligent uh, preloading, um, like environments are kind of dispersing of things, they still remain in the cache. and so. We can actually optimize uh, to you know keep certain things alive uh, for a certain period of time. Yeah. Uh, so right now we're still on iOS seven. Is our I think seven one is our base. We're, we're actually looking to get rid of it within the next like one or two releases. Um, but yeah. All of our testing is goes back all the way back to there. Yeah, so the, the question was, can we use the dipping algorithm for uh, basically like intelligent insert and deletes for like a table or collection view? Um, yeah, so the, the implementation of this is strictly for the layout. Um, you know, there have been talks of like kind of going in that direction, um, but I don't know if you saw um, IG List Kit came out yesterday. Um, so Instagram just basically released a, a new uh, solution just to do that. and. They use a very similar, uh, like, longest common subsequence algorithm. That's, yeah, I recommend checking that out. Yeah. Um, so, so the question was to, does it depend on pin remote image, pin cache? Yeah. What does? Sure. So the question was basically, if say if you had like a like a 
node hierarchy and you were manipulating a, a view, say you had like a gesture recognizer to it, like how does it function with that? Um, so the thing to think about with this node abstraction, it doesn't replace the view hierarchy. It just kind of like sits on top of it. And so anytime you want to do some of those like UI kit interactions, you just have that view property. You immediately can drop down to it or, you, or if you're dealing with a layer, you can just drop down to the layer. And so say if you had something like, um, you know, just like a node with like a bouncing ball node inside of it, that's still a view. And so you can, inside of the implementation of maybe your, your canvas node, um, you could set up like um, gesture recognizers that interface with that node. And so, um, you know, I would say that the beauty of the original simplicity of like async display kit one is that it doesn't take you away and like put you into a whole new ball game. Like you're still dealing with UI kit, you're still dealing with, um, you know, the core animation. And so you can like really build these things uh, like you're used to. Yeah, uh, so the question is, uh, what about core graphics? How do you, like, do, do you, like, a draw rec or something like that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah so, like, um, kind of going back to that, that idea of, like, uh, layout and drawing are done asynchronously. Um, so I really focus on the layout here so you can kind of see how, like, that measure pass is done asynchronously. Um, so the, the drawing aspect is in a similar boat. Um, however, basically, you have a method within your node um, that is basically a, a thread safe implementation of, of a draw rect. So you're responsible as a developer to basically create like some sort of context object that has enough information that when like the, the queue is ready to process, uh, uh, kind of draw that, like do your core graphics instructions that you provide maybe like the background color you wanted or like, like the certain curve, uh, basically enough of that state that um, allows um, basically the drawing to happen asynchronously. So it's pretty similar to what you're used to with UI view, um, but there are some considerations you have to take into account because of the fact it is going to be run on, on a background thread. Uh, no, I, I would say it's, imagine it's, it's like draw rect, um, but the fact that draw rect wouldn't be able to maintain state because otherwise it wouldn't be thread safe. And so basically you have to construct um, some sort of like stateful object that um, would be passed into that draw rec. So it's like, I forget the exact actual like params for it, but it's like draw rec with parameters. And so basically in that, within, within that like parameters object, that's the state that you would normally have is like within your draw rec. Yeah, so pretty close. Yeah, one more. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll go into two parts here. Uh, first, like, yeah, it's absolutely customizable. Um, so, like, the size of those ranges, we call them screenfuls, and so basically, you can say it's like maybe 1.5 screenful, you can say it's three screenfuls. And so uh, you have the ability to essentially tune that. Um, and you can get to a point where you're tuning it per device and like really kind of making it custom to the individual CPUs. Um, kind of the, the second point, um, what's interesting is that uh, the animation didn't show is that when you're kind of scrolling, there's not only ranges below, but there's ranges above. And as you're scrolling in a certain direction, those ranges will increase and decrease in size so that, okay, as, as I'm scrolling up, the, the ranges on top will be actually a lot smaller. And the reason they're smaller is so that um, a, a lot of that, that memory can be freed or, or um, a lot of those operations uh, are not as important. But the moment that you switch scrolling directions, they will invert. And so then you'll have optimization ahead of time instead of below. Um, so there's some like very interesting optimizations around those, those ranges that we've done.
Ya, vamos. Yeah, um, so I'd say like most apps have like collection view or table view heavy. And so like that's definitely like a natural entry point. So like you can put those table views and, and collection views into your view hierarchies and not really worry about the ASDK side of things. Um, but there, is, there are pathways where you can essentially like instantiate your own nodes and um, there are sometimes benefits to you know calling uh, you know instantiating it yourself and inserting it directly into the hierarchy um, because it, you could still create entire like node hierarchies concurrently. You can still like dispatch the render uh, the like the backing layer rendering concurrently. So like I wouldn't recommend like look, investigating that side of things, but like definitely these like node containers they allow you to essentially insert it into parts of your app and not really. Have the whole framework take over your whole app. So. Cool. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>